we know from the book of Hebrews, it's not about genealogy and God's chosen. It's about those who follow Christ. So this is about Christ and his people. So we're going to get started. Okay. Okay. What's going on with this? Oh, I'll get back to here. Hold on. Okay. Did you see that? That's huge. Okay. So this is where religion versus the Bible. You choose. Uh, Matthew 5 and 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is that saying to us? We know the spirit of the Pharisees. Their righteousness lies within themselves, their rituals, their rooks, and the teaching of the elders. So Christ is requiring more from us than our self-righteousness, our traditions, our rituals and rope. He requires that we trust in him fully. And when we trust in him fully, then our righteousness will succeed that of the Pharisees because the Pharisees rejected him. And so up here on the screen, we have the blue pill and the right and the red pill. So the reason that we have that up there, because if you are steeped in religion and religious tenets and traditions, then you're not going to be able to embrace the truth of the Bible. Um, unfortunately, we have been taught <clears throat> and misled um, through some of our teachings. And we ask you to have an open mind to listen to what thus saith the Lord. None, none of what we are going to present to you this evening is our opinion. Um, none of it is made up. Everything that we are going to come to you with this evening is from the Bible. We're going to give you plenty of scriptures um, and plenty of references. So we ask that you get a pen and a paper. Again, write your questions down, write your scriptures down, and you know, let's delve into this word. So we know it all started in the garden with Adam and Eve. We know they had a covenant with God and it was to follow his, his rules that he set forth in the garden. And we know that they broke that covenant. So in the garden, we have our first uh, template of marriage, you know, between Adam and Eve, you know, those Mr. Um, Richardson, you muted yourself, I think. Okay, sorry. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Right. So we we get into the obvious thing. If he came from the dust of the earth, we know what color dust is. You know, it's it's not the white sandy beaches. We know that dust is brown, and we know that we are created in God's image. So, um, again, he says God's covenant. They got kicked out for breaking the covenant. So Adam and Eve are covenant breakers. <clears throat> From that point on, God began a rescue plan for his creation. So God gave terms of residency to his first tenants, Adam and Eve. They rebelled against him, against his rules. I can't see that. Um, because so, were removed from their home in Eden. Similarly, the Canaanites live within a promised land also. Do we need to move the pictures yeah. now? Okay, give us a second. 
Okay. okay. They were allowed to remain there until their continual sinning became an insult to God. To all God allotted that the land's borders to represent. God told Abram that his descendants, the Israelites, would not be allowed to move into this land until its current occupant sins were full. And you can reference that in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 16. God, being omniscient, already foreknew of, the, of this Canaanite, coming Canaanite removal to make way for the Israelites, which as promised, came to pass almost 400 years later. So God sets the provisions and the rules for his tenants. You know, he created this whole earth and he made the rules for Adam and Eve and they broke the covenant by eating of the tree of life. So they violate that covenant and sin entered to the world through them and through the loss of innocence being manipulated by Satan in the garden. So their self-consciousness produced guilt, fear, and even blaming. And that condition, that evil to enter into the garden, God could no longer walk with Adam in, in the cool of the breeze and talk with Adam because we know that God don't look and God can't look at sin. So he had him and Eve had to be removed from the garden for breaking that covenant. So they were kicked out of the garden. So God as the land's rightful owner gave his former tenants, the Canaanites, a set of rules by which to abide. He did the same for the land's new tenants, the Israelites. These regulations are found listed in the Bible's Old Covenant. They contain both promises of prosperity on the land for those who kept its stipulations and curses and removal from the land for those who disobeyed and rebelled against them. In regard to these blessings and curses, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 give detailed explanations how God uses them as an established rule in his kingdom. And we will be touching on them more um, in part two. Okay, so if they agreed and were responsible, they could stay. But just like he did to the Canaanites, disobedient former tenants, God could equally remove the Israelites from this same land if he deemed them deserving. Moses lists for us a set of these rules in Deuteronomy. So we talk about, you know, this organized religion always focuses on blessings, but there are blessings and there are curses. So when we teach the Bible, we need to teach it balanced. We're not supposed to just teach about the bless, blessings and the goodness of God and what we're going to get from God. But we also need to teach on sin, the consequence of sin, the consequence of breaking God's rules as well. Okay. And as a consequence for our breaking the rules, um, this is how we ended up where we are. So now we move to the antediluvian world. The antediluvian world is the world before the flood. The world before the flood. Okay, so Satan needs a body to carry out his evil in the earth, Genesis 4. After this, the firstborn man of Adam and Eve was the murderer, Cain. And you see the chart that's on the right of your screen. Um, it kind of gives you the bloodline. So, and it is apparently a coincidence intimating the nature of Cain when our Savior speaking of Satan says he was a murderer from the beginning. And that's referenced in John 8, 44. God needs a body to carry out his will and his good and his good righteousness 
Hebrew and the Bible. It can be put anointed, compensation or appointed. In the Bible, Seth was the third son of Adam and Eve, a replacement for Abel after his brother Cain killed him. Mm-hmm. So what do we mean when we say antediluvian? Well, that's of or relating to the period before the flood described in the Bible and is may evolved or developed a long time ago. So Genesis 9 and 1, the other side of the flood, that's we, where we come yes, we know to Noah. Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And just a side note, Noah um, was... Um, what do we call them? When they Noah was an albino. He didn't look like everyone else on the earth. Everyone else was brown skin. Noah, um, he was he was albino. He he didn't have pigmentation. His family thought that he was. Um, a descendant from the fallen angels, and we'll get into that a little later. But that's you can find that in the book of Enoch. Now, let me just refer, let me just talk about the book of Enoch and the book of Jasher, which are books that um, you have to be willing again to come outside of. I know you've been taught that you know, um, those books are let me see, they've been called wicked, they've been called false, they've been called lies. The book of Noah, I'm sorry, the book of Enoch and Jasher, they were all part of the 1611 King James Bible. And if you get a 1611 King James Bible right now today, you will see the Apocrypha is a part of the original Bible. Um, The scholars decided to take it out because they said they were not inspired words of God. However, they are true, they are biblical, and the Catholics actually still have them in their Bible, but when they gave it to us, they took it out of the Bible. Um, They also um, say that they're not true, but if you take the time to read read and study these additional books, all the things that are in the Bible that you read that seems like there's something missing, it seems like this story is incomplete, you will find in the Apocrypha and in the books that are forbidden by the world. And remember, at one time, they took Revelation out the Bible, the book of Revelation out as well. So that's just a little side note for you. And also the book of Jasher. If the Bible makes reference to the book of Jasher, and Enoch. And Enoch. The, the book of the book of Jasher is referenced in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. Also in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. So they were using the book of Jasher as a reference back in the Old Testament. So back to the slide. Righteousness in the earth came through Abel. And we know that Cain slayed Abel. And Eve had another son called Seth. And through Seth, the righteousness of the earth in the earth continued through that line. You got Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then you have Noah and his three sons. But Shem, out of Noah's three sons, was the one to carry on the lineage of righteousness. The lineage of righteousness was carried on through Noah's three sons by Shem. So we're going to uh, go into Cain and Abel. And what was the problem with Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel? So what did God require 
for man's for atonement. So what was the problem between Cain and Abel? Abel was righteous and he gave his offering what God required, which was a lamb, a blood sacrifice. Well, it could have been. Abel knew what he needed to sacrifice, but he gave what he wanted. To. Cain. Cain, I'm sorry, Cain gave what he wanted and he offered the fruit of the ground. And the reason that God required that blood sacrifice was because of the sin. In the garden. So right. when Adam and Eve uh, sinned and they lost their innocence, and they begin, begin to cover themselves up with the fig leaves. And God realized that they sinned and they fell before he put them out to the garden. He did the first blood sacrifice and getting them coats to put on to cover themselves up. So there had to be, there had to be an animal slain and his blood shed for them to get those coats that they put on to cover up their bodies. And that was the first sign of a blood sacrifice and the blood being an atonement for sin. So those coats that they made, that he, that he made the Adam and Eve, he made it out of a slain animal. And the, those the, them wearing the coats was the covering for sin from that blood sacrifice. And from then on, you had that blood sacrifice that you had to do before God. So you couldn't do like Cain, just offer the fruit of the ground. The sacrifice must have been, must be blood, a blood sacrifice. And Abel offered up the lamb. And we know that Christ is the lamb of God and he would be the lamb that's offered up for the world. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, get that quick. Genesis talks about the uh, the seed of the woman. Give me a second. Yeah, I gotta have any question. <laughs> Genesis. Uh, Three talks about uh, Genesis three fifteen, and yeah, I will put the enmity. In the enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, with, when you finish with that scripture, it points to Christ and what Christ would do for us all at the cross, but also that enmity would continue in this earth up until Christ. And that enmity took place with their first two sons. And enmity is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. So we know that at this point, for man to be atoned for sin up until the point of Christ coming and Christ laying down his life as the acceptable sacrifice, there was a blood atonement, a blood sacrifice needed for atonement. So we go to the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch talks about the watchers. So even with the evil of Cain and Abel, and the evil that Cain brought into the world, there was an evil far greater introduced into the earth and that came through the rebels the watchers in the book of enoch it says chapter 6 verse 1 and it came to pass when the sons of man had increased that in those days there was a there were born to them fair beautiful daughters and the angels the sons of heaven saw them and desired them and they said to one another, let's come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the children of men and let us beget for ourselves children. 
So you can find that same passage in those same verses in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto men, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120. There were giants in the earth in those days. And after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that wickedness, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. So there was so much evil going on in the earth that God had to destroy the earth and only person and family that he could use was Noah. Noah was preaching in those days to repent when he started building that ark. God is give God spoke to him and told him to build the ark and he gave him the dimensions and how to build the ark. And for 120 years, he was preaching and building that ark. You got to understand at the time, there was no concept of rain. Right. It didn't rain back then. The, the water actually came up from the ground as a mist and it would refresh the earth that way. So of course, Noah building an ark, he looked quite ridiculous. And that's why he was heckled and he was <clears throat> berated by everyone who was on the earth at that time, because they just thought it was sheer foolishness. They had never seen rain. They didn't expect rain. You know, they were just living their happy, sinful lives. And how does that compare to what some of us go through right now? You know, we proclaim Christ. We witness Christ. But people, they just think it's foolishness because the things of God are foolishness to those who are not his. There was no oceans. There was no large water mass before the flood. And... For this incursion against mankind, God placed a judgment on these fallen angels, and that can be found in Enoch chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. Right, so Enoch 12 and 1. Before these things, Enoch was hidden, and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden and where he abode and what had become of him. And his activities had to do with the watchers. And his days were with the holy ones. And I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of majesty and the king of ages. And lo, the watchers, who are the angels, called me, Enoch the scribe, and said to me, Enoch, thou scribe of righteousness, go declare to the watchers of the heaven who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, and have done as the children of earth do, and have taken unto themselves wives. You have wrought great destruction on the earth, and you shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace shall ye not attain." So they received in their judgment for that incur incursion. So a little more about Enoch. Enoch reigned over the earth, and Enoch established righteousness upon the earth. And after 
residing to two residing 200 year, 240 years he is translated and Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah and Enoch walked with God after having begot Methuselah and he served the Lord and despised the evil ways of men and the soul of Enoch was wrapped up in the instructions of the Lord and in the knowledge and, and understanding. And he wisely retired from the sons of man and sacred himself from them for many days. And it was at the expiration of many years while he was serving the Lord and praying before him in his house that an angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said here I here I, here am I and he said raise up go forth from thy house and from the place where thou doest doest hide thyself and appear to the sons of man in order that thou may have teach them the way in which they should go and the work in which they must accomplish to enter in the ways of God. And Enoch rose up according to the word of the Lord, and he went forth from his house, from a place, from his place, and from the chamber in which he was concealed. And he went to the sons of men, and he taught them the ways of the Lord. And at that time, he assembled the sons of men and acquainted them with the instructions of the Lord. And he ordered it to be proclaimed in all places where the sons of man dwelt, saying, where is the man who wishes to know the ways of the Lord and good works? Let him come to Enoch. So Enoch, seven from Adam, was the righteousness in the earth at that time. And he was responsible for teaching all mankind uh, that would listen and that would come to him the things and the ways of God. So now we, we are talking about the timeline of the corruption of God's creation caused by these watchers. And where their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them, the 200 watchers, and those were the fallen angels, fast for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation to the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. First, um, Enoch 12, 10, 12, emphasis mine. Is it just a coincidence that there were 200 watchers who went down to Tartarus and were buried under the valleys of the earth where rivers flow, and that the book of Revelation records a release of four angels that are bound in the Euphrates River? Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. Revelation 9, 13 through 16. And let's not forget about the 200 million Nephilim soldiers who are going to come up out of the bottomless pit in the last days as well. The pre-flood Nephilim were on the earth for nearly 1,200 years. A lot of strange and wild stuff happened in that time frame. One thing is certain. It was certainly a, definitely a scary time to live on this planet. And let's look at that chart again. So there's a lot of stuff going on. 
So we see with all of this corruption, it was all about Christ's DNA being saved that the flood had to come. So we see within the 1200 years that the Nephilim was on this earth, they started creating all kind of freakish uh, experiments with God's creations. You can see some of them on the screen. You know, this the satyr, uh, the man with all the different arms, these dinosaurs and all of this stuff that they were creating in the earth, manipulating the DNA and God's creation, creating these monsters in the earth. And this went on for 1200 years. And remember, they were doing that because they knew that Christ had to come through a bloodline. And so they tried to, to um, corrupt. corrupt the bloodlines so that he wouldn't have a pure line to come through. And that was revealed in Genesis when Adam and Eve was put out of the garden. That Christ, being the second animal, would undo and get back what Adam lost in the garden when he come and he would sacrifice himself. So they was trying to stop Christ from coming through this corruption. So these are the watchers, the 200, not the one third that fell with Satan. These watchers have a special judgment a special judgment for corrupted mankind. And when the Bible said we will be judging the angels, right. these are the 200. These are the angels that mankind will be judging for the total corruption of mankind. You know, the fall of Adam and Eve was another kind of evil, but this evil was just off the chain. Right, because the one third that fell was Satan. They just followed him. They were following him and his evil and his evil agenda. But the 200 watchers, they it was their job to watch, watch over, over mankind. mankind. And instead of watching over mankind, they, they lusted, perverted. right? They lusted in their hearts after these women. And remember back in the biblical days, they were able to present themselves as men. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, there were many times in the Bible, if you're familiar with Bible stories where angels would come and talk to men, you know, they talked to um, Abram, they talked talk to, to Joshua. Joshua. So they were able at that time to present themselves as men. And so I guess that's why it was so easy for them to come and present themselves as men to these women. So we know there were giants in the earth and you can find that in Amos, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, and there's various other scriptures you can find about the giants in the earth. So the Nephilim and the Bible were giants in those days. So we see the height, 36 feet tall. And what was Goli Goliath was around uh, 12 foot between 12 and 18 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And numbers talk about it specifically. Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. When they talk about Anak, the giant, where the children of Israel, where uh, Moses sent in a representative from each of the 12 tribes to spy out the land. And they said they were, as in their sight, as grasshoppers to these giants. Mm -hmm. Then you got some of the other abominations that they created back in those days. So again, they were giants in the earth. And, you know, Genesis 6, uh, verse 4, and Numbers 13. And again, the giants and, you know, had Moses slain King Og. King Og was a giant. Mm -hmm. So now we're down to uh, 
Genesis 5, 24. And Enoch, he was the righteousness in, of God in the earth at that time. Seven from Adam, and he was very, very influential in the earth with the word of God and the righteousness of God. And God loved him so much that he didn't die. He walked with God until he was not. God took him up. So Jude chapter 1 verse 14 says, Now Enoch, seven from Adam, prophesied about these men and also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy saints. So that's talking about the end when Christ will return. Enoch prophesied about that then, of the return of Christ. So God had a plan to make up for the fall of Adam way before the flood. Right, and again, you see the genealogy of Adam, um, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and then his sons. So we know that Enoch was Noah's great-great-grandfather, right? Great-great-great-grandfather. Mm -hmm. So um, he came from a righteous line. So all the line, all the bloodline aligned with Adam is the righteous line, and it goes all the way down to Noah and Noah's son, Shem. So Shem would carry the righteous line in the earth with Noah. And then after Noah passing, it would be just Shem. Now you see in Cain's bloodline, there was an Enoch too, but he was not the righteous Enoch that walked with Christ, but that walked with God. So we know all of Cain's bloodline was done away with on the other side of the flood. So only Noah and his three sons came on the other side of the flood. Right. So back to Enoch and. So Enoch 15 and 8, and now the giants who were born from body and flesh will be called evil spirits on the earth and on earth will be their dwelling. And evil spirits came out from their flesh because from above they were created. From the holy watches was their origin and first foundation. Evil spirits, they will be on earth and spirits of the evil ones they will be called. And the dwelling of the spirits of heaven is heaven, but the dwelling of the spirits of the earth who were born on the earth is earth. And the spirits of the giants do wrong, are corrupt, attack, fight, break on the earth, and cause sorrow, and they eat no food, do not thirst and are not observed. So after the flood, this is what happened to the offspring of these giants. They became evil spirits still dwelling in the earth even after the flood, having no body, having no place to rest, having all the desires that Marie just mentioned the corrupt desires, the attack, the fight, the break, the cause sorrow. They have all those desires, but they don't have a body. So this is where the demons come in. And through our sins, they are able to inhabit our bodies and to cause us to offend God and to do things within us because of sin. So they roam the earth looking for a body. So this is the demons that are in there and that are in the earth. And they are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Their offspring. So 
We're coming up to Shem. So who was Shem in the Bible? Shem was one of the three sons of Noah before the great flood that God used to judge the inhabitants of the earth for the great wickedness, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man for whom I have created from the face of the earth, both, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repents me that I have made them. So Shem's line produced the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the Elamites, the Aramaeans, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites. So we're going to focus on Edomites. Remember Edomites, because that's coming in the next, the next lesson. That's going to come up in the next lesson. Arabs and Hebrews, Shem's name is the origin of the word Semitic. Shem's great-grandson, Eber, was the father of those who were eventually called Hebrews, including Abram. See Genesis 10 and 11 for more on Shem's line. So now the book of Jasher, chapter 9, verse 5. And when Abram came out from the cave, he went to Noah and his son Shem and remained with them to learn the instruction of the Lord and his ways. And no man knew where Abram was. And Abram served Noah and Shem, his son, for a long time. And Abram was in Noah's house 39 years. And Abram knew the Lord from three years old. And he went in the ways of the Lord until the day of his death as Noah and his son Shem had taught him. And all the sons of the earth in those days greatly transgressed against the Lord, and they rebelled against him, and they served other gods. And they forgot the Lord who had created them in the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth made unto themselves at that time every man his God, gods of wood and stone, which could neither speak, hear, nor deliver, and the sons of men served them, and they became their gods. See, Abram's story and his righteousness go back a long way. But in the Bible, we hear about him in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed on the Lord, and he, was, and he accounted it. For, to him for righteousness. So, so Abraham, Abraham served the Lord right. a long time since he was a child. So Jasher actually tells you about the life of Abram before he became Abraham. So we know in the Bible, it tells us that the Lord told him to get up out of the land of his father. Er, you get up right. out of there. But it doesn't give you the backstory, but you could actually find the backstory of that whole ordeal in the book of Jasher. It tells you about his childhood. It tells you why he had to leave the land of his father. It tells you, you know, everything. It just tells you how he served um, with Noah and Shem. You know, these are things that are not in the Bible, but they are in the word of God. So we know about the Abrahamic covenant. It all points to Christ. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 15, and it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, excuse me, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not and wells digged, which thou dig not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, 
from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. You shall not go after the other gods of the gods and of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Genesis 15 and 6, a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner. All of them were allied with Abram. So Abraham was a Hebrew. Abraham was a Hebrew. John 8 and 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So we know the Abrahamic covenant pointed to Christ. And that's why Christ could say, before Abraham, I am. Because it was about him in the garden, and it was about him through Abraham. So Shem, again, Shem was one of the sons of Noah in the Hebrew Bible, as well as the Islamic uh, literature. The children of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. In addition to daughters, Abraham, the patriarch of the Hebrews and Arabs, was one of the descendants of Arkfaxit. So you have the chart over here. It shows the patriarchs of righteousness from Abraham. I mean, so from Adam all the way down to Jacob. And we know Jacob is Israel. And we know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our forefathers yes so and we know that they are hebrew all okay. hebrews and these were the generations of shem and shem was a uh, hundred years old when he forgot our factor and two years after the flood and shem lived and begot our factor five hundred years And beget and sons, and, sons and, daughters. and daughters. So Shem outlived Abraham. He lived to be 500 years old. Abraham died at 175. I think so. Luke 336, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Ar Arphaxid, which was the son of Sem, which was the son of Noe, which was the son of Lamech. So, so Jacob has a twin brother. So remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob had a twin brother. Which was Esau. Which was Esau. But see, you see Esau is not listed there because he was not in the line of those who was the righteous in the earth. Right. Esau has his own agenda. So Jacob was chosen to carry on that lineage from Isaac. So Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So Esau is who's, who's ruling, ruling right, right now. now. And Esau rules in the form of Edom and Edom is Rome. So Esau, Edom was conquered by Kittim. Kittim is a descendant from Japheth. And Kittim and Edom merged as one people. And Esau, Edom is Rome. They're Rome now. And just a side note for you for Esau and Jacob, they were twins. Remember, they were in their mother 
Rebecca's womb and they were fighting. And she asked, um, why, why was she so troubled in her womb? And she was told that she has two nations in her womb. Now, when you read the story, um, you know that Jacob was what they call comely. He looked like everybody else. He was a Hebrew. He was brown. Esau, on the other hand, was hairy. Red. He had red. He was red. So when you look at who we call Caucasians, they are red. And they're pretty hairy. And look at Donald Trump. They red like they on fire all the time. So that's Esau, just to give you a visual. So there were two, there were two brothers, Jacob, who looks like us, and Esau, who looks like, say, Donald Trump. <laughs> and then when you mix with other lighter persuasions, then you can become more whiter and red. So that's just a side note, but we're going to address that in part, part two. two. So look out for Edom slash Rome. Okay, so where we at? I think that's it for the night. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, as Matthew 24 and 37. So again, we just wanted to give you just a history to let you kind of know when we go into the 12 tribes and when we go into um, the line that Christ came through and when we go through Esau and Edom and we go through Israel, that you kind of have an idea of exactly, excuse me, <clears throat> who it is we are talking about so that you won't be completely unawares of the history. We know that it was a lot. We know that you were probably thinking at some point, what does this have to do with anything that I'm looking for? But trust me, it all ties together. And um, it's really important that you know this history because in knowing this history, um, you can kind of know where you come from in order to know who you are and where you're going. All right. So I guess now if anybody has any comments, questions, commentary um you know now's the time thank you so much we appreciate this lesson my mind is i'm trying to i'm gonna be honest i'm trying to process it all and chew it all and i'm just like wow it's so much stuff about the lineage that i didn't know and my question is where can we maybe because I'm like excited about part two and I want to go a little bit ahead. Where would we be able to find the book of e Enoch and the book of Jasper just to give me a little background education? How yeah, can I uh, be prepared? Are, are you a part of uh, Sister Gwen's group? Yes. Uh, uh, she has, um, we've sent those two books to her and I guess if she could email it to you and you can kind of read it. For yourself. Mr. Al. Yes. If anybody has, I don't know if it's full, but I have it on my phone. You can download the Cipher. Yeah, yeah. And the it's Cipher. free. Yeah. In the place. yeah, you can actually get them all on PDF. Um, but it, we did send, like we said, Jasher and mm, Enoch, Enoch to Sister Gwen. So if you if you are in contact with her, you can actually get it from her or um, I can send it. You can send your email. That's up to you. Yeah, whichever way you want to do it, we can get it to you, though. Okay, Anybody who's interested. So much. Yes, because I'm just like, I didn't know it was a twin brother. Like, I'm, my mind is blown away. So, yes, thank you so much. I appreciate this. All right. God bless. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I joined late, um, around 7.30ish. I may have missed this. Um, quick question. Why why isn't these books contained in, like, the normal Bibles that we would see at church? Um, you know, 
if you could, if you get a King James 1611 Bible, all of these books are actually still in the original King James Bible. But you have to go way back. You know, these, when these books was included, it was in the 1800s and up into the 1800s. And then the Catholic church began to take those books out because if you really get into the books and you line it up to the, with the Bible, with the Bible being the point of reference, you know, I wouldn't encourage anybody to read these books if they don't read the Bible. You have to know the Bible in order to weigh these books. And the reason that they were taken out is because they fill in a lot of the... Um, the hidden hand right. behind the, uh, the deception. Right. You know, so the Catholic Church was the people who canonized the Bible, who chose which books would be available for the average person. And they kept these books for themselves. So remember, before the uh, Protestant Reformation, before the Reformation, no citizen, no person was allowed to have a Bible, only the Catholic Church. So since the Reformation, when Martin Luther, John Wesley, all these different reformers, they began to print the Bible, but they only made available to them, you know, most of the regular Bible. And only few of them ventured off and put the Apocrypha and all the writings in there. Okay. But the rest of them just put, you know, they broke it down to what they wanted to put in the Lutheran movement, the Protestants, the Baptists, you know, they kind of broke down what part of the Apocrypha would they would allow in their books, you know. But a lot of the true writings in the true Bibles, you have to go in these old bookstores and find these Bibles from the 1800s to really get the Apocrypha in it and stuff like that, because in the 1800s, they were still reprinting the 1611 King James Bible. And that Bible is available if you go to Amazon. Um, I know you can find this 1611 and with the Apocrypha in it. But some of them, they are pretty pricey. They so, are. so they 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 try to get you with overpricing them to the point where you like. They kind of deter you, know, you the from The little getting it. Bible might cost you $75. You know, but you do have apocryphas in PDF form where you can purchase from Amazon. It's the same writings, you know. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Amen. God bless. Also, I'm sorry. Follow up question. Um, I see this has been recorded. Is there a, a um, possible that I can get? Um, because I missed the the first half hour. I'm able to get uh, email um, the first part of the lesson, like the whole lesson, so I can go over it again. Absolutely. Um, Sister Gwen. Yes, if you put your email inside of the chat, I can make sure you get emailed. I'm not sure who invited you on, but um, all the ladies, they definitely have access to it. Um, but yeah, there'll be a link. If you put your email in there, we'll definitely make sure you get it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. There it is right there. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, my name is Scott. I, uh, the question I have, maybe it's more, uh, some of them would be maybe offline. Uh, but my question is, I'm, you know, I'm white. You know, I'm, I'm and so I, I barely hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me better now? Yes. A little bit, yes. So I was just wondering, um, you know, I, I know that there's going to be a, uh, that there's already some hint that there's a, like a divergence between, uh, you know, more melanated people and then nice people. Um, is it, you know, I can see how it could be a, kind of emotional. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, how, how often do you encounter people with different uh, races or ethnicities in your teaching? And 
how do you address how they may feel about um, their place in the store? Well, well, I feel like this is the Bible and Christ died for all people. So it's not about black and white and it's not really about race. It's about Christ and those who accept Christ. So we don't look to offend anybody with the teaching, but God's word is plain and it's clear. And we have been um, browbeat and taught that we are not who we are. And we have been taught that Christ is someone different. So what we're doing is just trying to let people come to the understanding and know the truth of the Bible. Um, Hebrews or African-Americans or people of color, we are the only people who don't know our heritage. We don't know who we are. We don't know our ancestors. We can only go back as far as the slave ships, but we didn't start at the slave ships. That's where history, that's where his story started. So what we did was to find out the true history of God's people, of the Hebrews. We There's no way you could start at being a slave and being put on a ship. You know, everyone has a heritage, a lineage. And so um, we just ask God to reveal to us who exactly are the people of of the Bible, who are the Hebrews, and, you know, he just opened it up to us. Again, we, we are not about race baiting. We are not about separation because anybody who accepts Christ as their personal savior who lives and follows his laws, statutes, and commandments are children of God. You know, God is not a respecter of person. And so we just want to teach the truth of who God is and the truth of the Bible. Did that, did that answer your question somewhat? Ray, I was on mute. Um, thank you very much for, for the information. I look forward to um, where we uh, take it from there. I can't hear you. Say that again, sir. I'm sorry. I said thank you very much for uh, the, the response. And I look forward to hearing the uh, the second half of this, uh, this lesson. Yeah, God bless you. Amen. God bless and invite some more people as well. Thank you so much. Definitely uh, uh, Caucasian people. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> any Anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, if not, you know, we will um, meet again next Thursday, Lord willing, for part two, again, where we're going to talk about Deuteronomy 28, um, the blessings and the curses. We're going to talk about the 12 tribes and being scattered. Um, what else are we talking about, sir? Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 28, the church, 70 AD. Right. How the church... Uh, got corrupted and how we find ourselves in this religious situation that we find us ourselves in today, where the early first century church is truly not represented in this church, uh, religious uh, structure today, and how it's all just a break off and the breakaway of the Catholic church through denominations and all those things. So we look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. Thank you for coming out and sharing, you know, allowing us to share with you what we've learned. And we pray that um, it helped you and kind of gave you a little insight. And we hope that it will encourage you to pick up the, not only God's word, but pick up the Apocrypha and, you know, get to know 
the truth of the Bible. I just wanted to comment and say this. Um, when you think about those books, Jasher and Enoch, you know, um, it can be, um, what's the word? Intimidating because we're not used to seeing it in our everyday, you know, Bible. And I know that you guys did um, mention, but I just wanted to reiterate it that, you know, our Bible references these books, though. And I haven't went and read them myself because I was waiting for the Holy Spirit to move me to that direction because I was uncertain and unsure about it. But, you know, I was recently rereading the book of Samuel, and you did give the scripture for that. And it does reference the book um of um jasher so again i just wanted to reiterate to people who may be a little skeptical about those books that it the, our bible does reference those books and i personally do plan on reading them so that way i can get some of the missing information that you know that we are missing amen and remember when they took when they took them out of the bible they took them out because they said they were not the inspired word of God. They are more historical books. And because they don't deem history important. Because they want to portray their history. So you have to look at the hand that moves everything and the motive behind it. But again, I say make the Bible your point of reference first. Absolutely. Before you venture off in any other book, know what the Bible is saying understand the Bible, read and study the Bible. And like, like Sister Gwen said, the Holy Spirit will unction you to go further as you put in time before the Lord and through his word. Because mm -hmm. he said at the end times, those things that were hidden shall be revealed. Amen. Amen. Is that if if that's it, we'll say our good nights. Um, again, God willing, we will see you all next Thursday at 7 p.m. for a part two. Thank you so much. All right. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless. God bless you all. Good night. Good night. Come on. Yeah. There you go. All right, Sister Gwen, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, have a good night. All right. You too. God bless. <laughs> What's up? What's going on, man? <laughs> All right. God bless you guys. Good night. All right. Leave meeting.